Where were you? When are you going back? <laughs> Where'd you go? What are you doing? Okay, good morning. Yes. I uh, would open to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Judges 6. Okay, so we're going to be covering Gideon today. Uh, he's the next judge in our line of judges that are, um, that we see in Israel's history, that follow. Um, now, Gideon in particular, uh, he followed basically what would have been Deborah and Barak. And so Israel had had rest for 40 years, and then we're told in chapter 6, verse 1, that, uh, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made them dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was, when Israel had sown, uh, the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza. Okay, so basically they would have been from the eastern border. Now this is in the south region, but nevertheless this is eastern border of Israel leading all the way to Gaza, which is basically uh, western border uh, along the Mediterranean heading down also towards, um, basically on the way to Egypt, towards the Sinai Peninsula. So you had a, a large span of territory that was taken and uh, plundered by, by Midian. Uh, and in particular, it also mentions here that uh, uh, the Amalekites and um, others of the East, other children of the East. And it says, uh, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. So not just their actual crops, but the actual, the, the livestock that they would have had. Uh, they had nothing to eat at all. No, well, they were taken, they were basically in a... Um, <laughs> were they captive? Not quite, but they were um, overwhelmed and overpowered. In other words, they didn't really have defensive measure uh, that they could have gone up against Midian in particular. Um, this is Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So it seems basically that these are nomadic tribes that come through and then sweep through the land. Now this is Israel's land. They're harvesting it, they're developing it and such and then they don't really have the strength to be able to hold off these other guys. It'd be like the bully that comes in when you're in school, you know, and he wants to take your lunch money, or he wants to take your lunch, or he wants to take whatever he wants. You know, he's stronger than you, and, you know, what are you going to do to stand up to him? <laughs> if you have strength, you probably could do something, and if you have some intelligence with you, you know, uh, as far as to try and outsmart him and such, but they didn't really have that. And that was in particular because they did evil on the side of the Lord. Are we still talking then, about the New York trip? No. <laughs> <laughs> but they, uh... I'll tell you guys about that in a bit, if you, if you guys want. Okay, curious. Okay. <laughs> but they, they, were, they weren't able to really prevail over Midian. Uh, and then it says, It came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Now this is pretty interesting. Okay, This prophet's not the deliverer, but this prophet said, by God with a message to Israel to kind of wake them up to the reality of, you know, why are you in this position? Why are we in this position? Um, they had done repeatedly, too. Say again? They had done repeatedly, I think, what they want to say. They had done repeatedly. They had done evil repeatedly after each judge that had come and died. Yeah, that, that's, that's been their cycle. It isn't necessary for them to have to be in that position. That's the thing. They don't have to go into sin to be delivered. They can have blessing if they would just be obedient. That's the thing that we're going to see repeatedly. It's almost like a broken record here as far as uh, a lot of the content. Because you can go from time period to time period in Israel's history, and then you have different delivered um, 
but the folks still act the same, and it's it's kind of sad. Um, here's the prophet's message, God's prophet message to them. Said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God, fear not the gods, small g of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Uh, and there came an angel, okay, and so that's his message, you know. You're here because of your own doing. In other words, you're crying to me because of the oppression of the Midianites, you know, on you, in that they come and they take everything that you harvest, or that you're supposed to harvest. They come and they take everything uh, that would be of gain, uh, that would be of profit to you, um, and it's because you're, you're disobedient. You know, I, and he promised them even before going into the land, uh, before Joshua would lead them in and says, you know, only fear thou, fear thou the Lord and obey him, uh, that it should be well with thee. And in, in the times that you were to disobey, if you should disobey, seek to disobey, then God's going to cause those that are going to be there to prevail against you. Uh, he's going to weaken not just you as a, not that they were militarily, uh, that they had military prowess, but rather they would also have a lack of rain. He would cause their crops basically not to bring as bountifully as it would normally. And uh, there's a, the, I mean, basically the land would be cursed as well as a result of, of their disobedience. So it would bring forth as what God would normally bring out. And so he wakes them up to the fact, hey, this is your doing. You know? Now God's good and God's gracious. It tells us here that um, he not just sent them a prophet, but he's, we're going to see now he's going to raise up a deliverer. And it says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sent under an oak, which was in Oprah, uh, that pertained to, unto Joash the Abbey Ezrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Okay, so we see he's in hiding uh, while doing his work so that he basically wouldn't have what he has taken from him. Uh, if he's out in the open, and then it's going to be okay. You know, no, they would have free reign basically to come and overpower him and take it. Uh, I can't really do much of anything against. It says, "An angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, the mighty man of valor." And Gideon said unto him, "O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us?" of saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And then here's God's response to the angel of the Lord. The Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Now I know this seems kind of silly, but like, okay. Um, this, our first point, or not, say again. Was it an angel talking to him or was it God? Well, it was an angel of the Lord, so it was God through the angel of the Lord. So how but did, how it, did the Lord look upon him and the angel was on the ground? Well, he's omnipresent. It's also argued that the angel of the Lord is a, it's basically a type of Christ. Um, but um, it, the text actually does specifically say that the Lord looked upon him and then stated to him. But we see the interaction actually initially that uh, uh, the angel of the Lord so it, it, he's just a messenger he's God's messenger give forth and it's okay God's he's got to speak all the what God would tell him uh, good morning we are in Judges chapter 6 Judges chapter 6 and then you're down to verse 14 so we come to the first point in our outline here and that is that he was chosen of God for his character he was chosen by God for his character. Uh, and that is, um, what do we see about Gideon here in his character? At least as far as what the angel of the Lord indicates. He calls him what? A mighty man of valor. We see just the description of him being that he's from uh, the family of A.B. Azer. His dad's name is Joash. 
uh, or the family lineage, and then their tribe in particular happens to be from Manasseh. And we, we would get that from, from Chronicles as far as like when we see the, the lineage breakdown. Um, but, so, okay, he's not, it's not a very significant tribe. Um, actually, Manasseh himself was pretty wicked. He was one of the few that were not blessed <laughs> whenever, uh, and this uh, Genesis 50, 50, uh, where you have 49, 50, whenever the, the blessing and the cursing are pronounced, when J uh, Jacob, or Israel, basically blessing his kids at, right before he's getting ready to pass. Uh, but Manasseh would have been the ones, one of the ones that would have been violent and done more wickedly. Um, I mean, so his, his tribe, not very significant, he's not... Okay, so we see that he is basically a farmer. Um, but we see described here, he says, you're a mighty man of valor. And he says as well that go in this, uh, go in this thy might. Okay, so he's got valor. And there's something significant about what he said to the angel of the Lord in response to his call to him, that God calls his might. And what do you think that would be? Strength. Well, yeah, well, yeah, we know might is strength, but what what is <laughs> what is particular to that of his statement? His, okay, I'll just go to say it. I probably have an easier time just getting the stating stuff instead of asking. Uh, all right. He states he's a mighty man of valor. Okay, the, the idea of valor is not just that he's courageous, but he also has like integrity. He has character to him. Okay, so that's it's it's a wholeness there. It's it's uh, it's his integrity, and he says that go in this thou might. Now he says that immediately following his response, which was uh, if God is actually with us, um, he says oh. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where is all his miracles which our fathers have told us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? You know, and then it's, it's almost like he's like just bitterly crying out, you know, Hey, God's forsaken us. He's left us. He's abandoned us. You know? Um, but he says, where, where, Where's everything that we've seen? We've heard of it. It's almost like uh, when Job cries out. And it's, nah, well, not quite, but it reminds me of where he cries out, he says, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. Okay, so, God, I've heard all the stories, but where's the reality? You know, where are you at? Uh, so that's his response. And it seems almost out of anger, necessarily, but he's, he's crying out like, okay, if God's really with us, where's he at? The fact is, this doesn't match up. This reality that I'm experiencing and that Midianites can overpower us easily. You know, they have us basically in poverty. Um, I'm having... <laughs> He didn't say this, but he basically, he's hiding while threshing out his, his, his wheat, his crop, so that he wouldn't have, you know, basically, the, that he wouldn't put out that enticement for the Midianites to come and just take whatever he, whatever he is uh, harvesting, whatever he does have. Uh, and then just the state that Israel finds himself in. You know, this is their land, you know, not somebody else's land for them to come and do whatever they want to with. Uh, and, you know, this is Almighty God that, well, he references it again as far as that we've been delivered out from Egypt, uh, world's greatest power at that time. And who, by the way, also put the fear of them into all the nations that were in that land when they were coming in, if we were to go back to Joshua. So this doesn't match up. This doesn't seem like this is the same person or the same God that, you know, that we worship. Um, there, there's a, there's, there seems to be like this big discrepancy here. So what's going on? So his might uh, is the fact that he's got a burden. Uh, he's burdened to see the hand of God work. Uh, he's burdened for his nation, uh, obviously, so he would be a patriot. Uh, God of him states that he has integrity. Okay, so that would be the, the valor aspect, what he calls a mighty man of valor. It's not just that he's courageous, but he has integrity. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's, a, a, he's an individual of character. Now, 
we'll later on see as far as that he does make a lot of really bad choices and so he doesn't end very well necessarily but at this point in his life he's a man of integrity he has character and that God calls him mighty man of valor and he says go in this thy might so his might would be uh, his burden to see God work to see God do something and to know the living God that he's been taught about okay he's heard about he's very familiar with as far as uh, content of scripture but it seems that okay this isn't matching up my reality and so he says also by the way that um, have not I sent thee okay so he doesn't have to concern himself with whether or not um, opposition is going to be strong or rather that um, you know really what's what he's going to face is because the fact is God is promising here that he's going to be with him and he's going to go with him He's sending these. So the fact is, if it's God that's making the command, he's going to make every provision available for me to be able to go ahead and fulfill what he's commanded me to do. So he recognizes this. Um, and then the next thing, that leads us to the next thing, is that he was obedient to God's commands towards him. And we see that in, if you were to skip down, to verse 27. Okay. We just read, he said, you know, have not I commanded thee. Um, and so his God's command is, you're going to save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. You know, go go and save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. I've called you. So verse 27, and then Gideon took ten men of his servants. Oh, I'm sorry, go up a little bit before that. Um... Verse 25, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. And then build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. And then verse 27, it says, Gideon took ten men of his servants, and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was. Uh, so he basically obeyed. Now it, it tells a little bit more detail. It says, it beca uh, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. But nevertheless, he did obey. Okay, so, um, yeah, there's a little bit of trepidation there as far as because now you are, it's seemingly going to be against not only your own father's household, but basically the whole town. So now it's, it's like, okay. Um, but he went ahead and he, he followed through on what God had told him to do. Um, we see that in the morning that the men of the city come about to Joash, confront him, and they want him to bring out his son so that they could kill him. If we were to read down through the end of the chapter, that's basically what's going to go on here, is that you have the men confront his father. His father defends him, actually, and then... He actually, this is pretty interesting because his father puts forth an argument and says, okay, if Baal is actually God, let Baal stand up for himself, let Baal defend himself. And so he, uh, he's able to, 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 to stop uh, the men from basically going forward to wanting to kill his son uh, with, with his reasoning. And so from there, uh, Gideon is uh, given a nickname, uh, Jero Baal. Um, basically, he, he threw down Baal. And so... From that forward, that's how he's going to be referred to as. And then go to chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, and then, uh, then Jerubbaal, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. Okay, and the Lord said to Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give to the Midianites into their hands. Uh, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. And then he's going to instruct him as far as how to reduce the amount of people that he has with him. And that's the, most of the accounting that we're going to see here forward. And then um, he uh, go down to verse 8. Okay, so, people, so the people took victuals in their hands and the trumpets, and he sent all the rest of, every, uh, all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men in the host of Midian uh, was beneath them in the valley. 
Uh, and then it says, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee thou unto the host, for I have delivered into thy hand. Uh, but if thou fear to go down, go down with uh, Fura, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thy hands be strengthened to go down to the, unto the host. Okay, then he went, on, then he went down with Fura, his servant, into the house of the armed men that were the host. And now he's going to overhear basically a, a discussion that uh, some of the Midianites were having. And then one had a dream about a loaf of bread. And basically at the end of that discussion, he comes to, he comes to find out that, hey, this is of Gideon and of the Lord. So how would they know him? <laughs> and, and, and and actually reference the God of heaven. Well, it's because God God put a fear of them and, and brought that knowledge about to, to me and as far as, okay, who he is and such. And so because of that, he was strengthened and he calls not only the folks that were with him, but he calls out a number of tribes to come out. Um, actually, he... he he takes the folks that are with him, the 300, and then he instructs them particularly as far as with the pitchers, with the lamp, and then with the trumpet, so that when he would blow, they would, boom, break the pitcher. From there, they go ahead and you have the incident where uh, the Midianites basically fall on themselves uh, because it's in the evening time, and then following that, going into uh, chapter 8 is where you would have um, he would all um, he would gather Israel as well towards him to go and fight. Go to eight chapter twenty two and twenty or yeah chapter eight verse twenty two twenty three. Okay. Uh, then the men of Israel said to Gideon, uh, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And then Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. Uh, the Lord shall rule over you. Uh, I know this is a lot of territory that we're covering. Uh, question, when was this historically? Like chronologically, when, when did this happen? When did this take place? Uh, like 12, 1300 BC. So... Obviously, this is way before they would have had, like, God given to them and say, hey, okay, look, they haven't rejected you, they rejected me. Because Samuel, this is, like, way before Samuel's time. Yes. Yeah, is it? okay. So, what was God's desire and design for them to be led? To be governed, how, how, how would he govern? Oh, just by God. Yes. With his all. And he would... The only reason he raised up a judge really was because of the fact that they were in bondage. And the judge ruled, but nevertheless, they were governed, I guess you could say in a Republican format, because they would have, what would be their constitution would be the word of God, God's word, God's law. And so that's what they referred to, even though they didn't really have like a legislative body uh, like we would. And that was God's intent, that was God's design, and that was because of well, uh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was because he wanted not only to distinguish himself, but that was his plan, to have them to be a light to the Gentiles. So God was going to be in the midst of his people, and they were to be a nation of, well, he wanted them to be a nation of king and priests, uh, but he wanted them also to, obviously, to be obedient. And so through their obedience, they wouldn't be like any, because no other nation would have really had the word of God or access to God like Israel had at this time. And nobody had their laws. And also beyond that, you have the fact that uh, he was in working through them. Uh, he wanted them to be that light of who God is. That was his plan for them. Okay, so now they're calling out, uh, now, this is a few generations before Samuel, obviously, for them to lead. Uh, because, hey, you delivered us. You're this great, strong leader. Lead us. Uh, and was that God's plan? It was for them to be delivered, but not to necessarily come and take and just usurp authority and be like, hey, I'm your boss now. But rather, so he recognizes his 
his limitation and he recognizes, hey, this isn't God's will. And so he, he says, you know, this is God's will is for you to be ruled by him. I don't want that. Okay, so that's all under, okay, our second point here is that he was obedient to God's commands towards him. All right. So we don't see necessarily that God specifically commanded, hey, don't take, but we see every instance in where God had said to him, do this, do that, do this. It says basically he would obey. He just did whatever God had told him to do. Um, now he might have been a little bit fearful necessarily when undertaking that, uh, and God made provision for him with regard to that, but he obeyed. He just basically obeyed whatever God had told him to do. Uh, and even even here, when you have this instance where he has the opportunity to be able to go ahead, I guess you could say, you're sub God's authority. He says, no, I don't want that. God had wanted to rule over you. God wants to rule over you. You know, let God rule over you. I can rule over you. And then this leads to our third point. Uh, and I put this in quotes, okay? The little indiscretions in his life brought great disaster later. Okay, and we see that um, we're in Judges chapter 8. Um, in particular in verses 24 to 27. Uh, it says, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings, because they were uh, Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a garment, and they cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he had requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was uh, on the kings of Midian and besides the chains that were about their camels' necks. Well, that's pretty cool. <coughs> you got, uh, <laughs> I wonder how thick those things would have been. Uh, gold chains on the, on the camels. And, uh, and then Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in the city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Okay, so this is one of the many. What's that? Uh, an ephod kind of is basically like would be like a vest. Like uh, the priests would have had one with multi jewels on it uh, that God had specifically uh, commanded or designed as far as whenever He gave in Leviticus uh, specifically for their worship. Uh, but that was that was something that was specific to Israel. But nevertheless, He as far as the ephod that He made. Uh, he just made a gold ephod. Um, now it seems kind of silly, but what would be a motivation for this? Like, what's the? Why would you? What do you think he would? Uh, I actually don't know. I suspect this is conjecture on my part that this would be a trophy of the victory that God had wrought, and so this is something that you would go ahead and have and say, you know, you could look to and say, okay, this is a memorial. Look what God did, you know, because we see that. Once he's done with what he did, he goes back to his house. And so all he does is he takes his ephod with him, uh, basically, that he made from uh, the, the jewelry of the, of, his, his, of the people who he had victory over. Um, but he personally didn't worship it. It's just something that it became a snare unto Israel, and they went a whoring after it. Um, and so, it, well, it says it became a snare unto Gideon into his house. Now, being that, that was something that they did. Uh, it wasn't commanded by God. It wasn't necessarily bad to have done. But what ended up happening with that is that now you have Israel looking towards it, uh, and it becomes sort of an idol that uh, Israel now, okay, of the many other things that they went ahead and pursued went ahead and tried to pursue it and as a result it became rather than something that would have been a blessing it ends up being something that being uh, a weight that brings down Israel and so that's that it's, that's why it's called a snare there uh, and then go to verse 30 uh, and then Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten uh, for he had many wives and then his concubine that was in Shechem, uh, she also bare him a son whose name he called uh, Abimelech. Okay, and then Gideon, the son of Joash, died at good old age and was buried in the sepulchre of Joash, in Ephra, 
of the Abizarites, and it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bereth their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, according to the goodness which he had shown unto Israel. Okay, so, um, <coughs> his kids didn't lead Israel into uh, their idolatry again. But what he did do, uh, as far as he had 70 kids, he had multiple. It were actually not stated as to what, how many wives he actually had. Um, but you'd have, I would imagine you would have to have a lot to be able to have 70 kids of your own body. And then it says that he had one of his concubine named uh, Abimelech. We'll read here following. What Abimelech actually does is that he ends up killing his other brethren because he's kind of despised because he's not looked at as being like a legitimate son because, hey, you're just a son of a concubine. You know, you weren't actually um, of someone that was of a legitimate marriage to our father or whatnot. And so um, Israel looked towards them and then he's going to he he's going to kill all his brethren and then he's going to end up wreaking havoc and causing somewhat, I guess you could say, of a civil war within Israel uh, during his time period in which he ends up kind of taking over and trying to judge Israel. Uh, so, now, all that could have been avoided in large part, and then what was, what's going to happen down the road uh, if he had been basically cautious and observant to, despite he had been obedient to God in many areas of his life, uh, this one area in particular, okay, giving himself over to multiple wives, uh, concubines, um, and being disobedient to God in that area uh, is going to wreak a lot of havoc in Israel. And then also we see that uh, because of the ephod that he had created, that it became basically like an idol to Israel. Uh, he could have destroyed that. That wasn't an unnecessary thing. And it ended up becoming a snare uh, because Israel would be brought down because they go a whoring after it. He could have recognized that and could have brought that to basically say, hey, look, this is not anything of value. Destroyed it, you know, and then giving God the glory and say, hey, look, point, try to point people back to God. Uh, but he didn't. And so his, his sin basically is going to wreak a lot of havoc in the lives of Israel as a result. Not just immediately, but also uh, for next generation following. And so here's some things that we learned. Um, though he wasn't perfect, he did have integrity, and especially in his starting. Um, he was chosen by God in particular for his integrity. He called him a mighty man of valor. And then he had a burden. He had a burden to know God. He had a burden to see God work. Okay, and so we can learn in that we should, uh, in what we've read, what we've been taught, uh, you know, what we learn from, from God speaking to us, uh, from you know, in our devotions, that um, God's real. God's real. And, and by the way, I think this distinguishes a lot of uh, Christians that, no, mind you, I can't judge a person's heart and I can't really, you know, uh, so ultimately when we stand before God, he's the one that we're going to give account to. Um, but I think as far as our effectiveness, quite often, this distinguishes a lot of Christians from others in that, you know, a lot of times we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be in a routine or habit, okay, we, we come to church and we, we perform a lot of activity, but do we have a burden or a heart to want to see active, you know, uh, not active interference, but active participation on behalf of God in our life. You know, in other words, can 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 not not just that we actively testify the fact, okay, yeah, God did this, God did that, but like also, um, you know, the unbelievers that God wants to reach out to through us. Can can they see actually God actively participating and working in my life? And by the way, a lot of that is seen not in a good time, but in a bad time, in difficulty, in trial. Uh, 
in, in those times where we we were, were sitting frustrated and we want to throw up our hands and say, okay, what's going on? Why is my life? It seems like it's a total, you know, like a mess, and I feel like I'm in a, the eye of a storm or something like that. And the fact is, that's the opportunity to be able to see God work and God bless, and He promises to be able to give peace uh, if we were to give Him our problems. Uh, we're told that in Philippians uh, chapter four. But do we have that same burden? Do we have that same integrity, that desire, that uh, uh, that longing to want to have God active in our life and work uh, beyond just the fact, okay, that okay, we are active in coming to services and those things. Okay, and then also he said that we were he was obedient to God's commands. Now, he was somewhat fearful because that is mentioned at least twice in uh, the accounts where he specifically commanded and he did provision for him, but nevertheless he was obedient. He see, he sought to follow through. Uh, he was careful to go ahead and follow through when God had commanded him something to actually go ahead and do what God had commanded. Uh, he didn't sit there and argue with God necessarily. He just went ahead and okay. Once he was convinced of the fact that this is what God wants, he went ahead and he did it. You know, and we, then we, we see God actively work on his behalf. And here's where we would differ, I would hope. And here's where I would, I would hope we would want to seek to differ is that we would be careful about sin in our life so that um, we wouldn't negatively affect not just those immediately around us, but the generations to follow. And the fact is, um, had he been careful to, to be obedient to God in that area in his life with regard to uh, the multiple wives and even having concubine, uh, then you wouldn't have had, okay, yeah, you wouldn't have had 70 sons and then have a little bit like, but nevertheless, the thing is, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have had all the disaster that followed as a result of that animosity between a little like and the 70 sons, and then he goes and kills you know, his <coughs> brethren, and, and then the, basically what ends up is you'll have eventually Israel in a civil war, and plus also the fact of the ephod, okay, which initially, okay, it's a trophy, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, I get to look and see, okay, this reminds me of, uh, and it seems like maybe that's not, ah, maybe it's something innocent, uh, but the fact is it could be a snare uh, to the brethren, and it was to, it was to Gideon in particular because it brought down Israel, and so what he had wrought in delivering them, uh, and, and seeing God work to deliver them for their idolatry, that he went ahead and just, seeming innocent area that now all of a sudden this becomes something that they they look to and ultimately the problem is with Israel because they have a heart that says I want to do what I want to do I don't want to obey God I want to go after my sin I like the pleasure of my sin more uh, than you know pleasing God more than being obedient more than having a clear conscience uh, so ultimately it's on them uh, but it, it states here that it was a snare unto Gideon. And so we need to be cautious as far as those areas in our life uh, that might seem, you know, maybe innocent, but like, how do I affect my brother? No man liveth unto himself and no man dieth unto himself. And the fact is, uh, I have a responsibility to my brethren uh, to, to make sure, hey, what's in my life is I'm, I'm, I'm clean and clear. Now I know not all of us are perfect. And, you know, we have the grace of God and we have forgiveness, We you know, First John 1 John 1.9, and we find ourselves in a position where we are uh, in sin, you know, confess it, and by the grace of God, you know, we'll, we can have, you know, we have victory uh, afforded to us and available to us. Uh, but we ought to be circumspect uh, and, and ever so cautious as far as what, you know, what, what I allow in my life or what I allow to influence or how I influence others. And so I, I need to be cautious, uh, not just with what I say, but how I act and, and those kinds of things as far as so that I don't affect um, you know my, my brethren in a negative fashion uh, even even inadvertently and so this is some lessons we learned from Gideon's life uh, he was actually a good judge he judged Israel and then Israel for most of the length of their time under his rule uh, and he had a good testimony up to basically I would say up until his end uh, they were they were obedient to God uh, but it's sad we <laughs> I 
I would love to be able to have said of me from his early part, but not his later part. So, but I would rather not have, you know, I would rather have somebody where you would have, uh, you know, like an Othniel or an Ehud, where you basically, you don't really have any kind of reproachful thing to be able to be said about them. Uh, so, uh, let's seek to be of those that don't have that in our life. All right. Does anyone have any questions? I know it's kind of like a, a, a lot. Three chapters. Oh, I'll, I'll mention this real quickly. In chapter six, the fleece, the fleecing, you know, putting forth the fleece before God. Um, I don't know, we've probably already heard a lot of people, or a lot of preaching, I should say, that uh, deal with the fact that, you know, Gideon was very doubtful, and then, uh, you know, because he was asking God for a fleece. The, the details of that accounting, oh, we don't really have a whole lot of time for this. Um, okay, go to verse... Verse 12. This is when he first appears. Okay, The angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Now, Gideon at this point is threshing basically in secret, in hiding. So it's just basically Gideon and, and, Gideon and the angel of the Lord. This is their interaction together. And then he says unto him, you know, uh, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And then this is Gideon's response to him. Verse 13. You know, and then the Lord looked upon him and said, Go this, uh, go in this thou might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, have not I sent thee. Now Gideon's response to the, to the angel, now, this is just them two. Uh, and he said, O oh, my Lord, wherewithal shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. The Lord said, him, said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, if I now, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Okay, depart not thence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry. That's the angel saying, okay, I'll, I'll wait for you to bring your present. And then depart not hence. Uh, okay, uh, verse 19. And Gideon went and made it ready a kid, an unleavened case of an ephah of flour, and the flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it unto him uh, under the oak, and presented it. Okay, and the angel of the Lord said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock. Pour out the broth, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up a fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed from out of his sight. And then when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. In other words, he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. And then the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not thou, uh, fear not thou shalt not die. You know, then Gideon built an altar unto the Lord and called the called it uh, Jehovah Shalom unto this day. It is an offering of the Israelites. So, you know, God is our peace. So at this point he's convinced basically, okay, oh, well, this is God really commanded me. Alright. Now moving forward, uh, he's commanded with regard to being able to take down the altar. Uh, and then we see the, the aftermath of that. Um, verse 33, go down to verse 33. Okay, and then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came unto Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. So his family was gathered after him. After This is following his incident with offering to the angel and then following, you know, um, throwing down the altar and all that. So you have Midianites and a whole host gathered. They pitch in this valley. And so now he blows a trumpet. Abiezer is gathered unto him. Uh, and then he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, um, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher, unto Zebulun, unto Naphtali, and they came to meet with them. So now you have Abiezer, you have uh, Naphtali, Zebulun, and Asher, and, and Manasseh, the rest of Manasseh, come together. And then, verse 36, And then Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, 
behold, I will put a fleece uh, of wool in the floor. Now the floor here is the threshing floor. Okay, that's their big open space where they go ahead and thresh. So you have, it's a big communal area as far as where they go ahead and they actually pound out for, uh, for bringing out the, the wheat. But, okay, mind you, who's gathered here at this point in time? A large crowd. Okay, you have a large crowd of basically tribe of Zebulun, Naphtali, Manasseh, uh, his particular family group of Abiezer, and then you have um, Asher as well that was gathered together because he had blown a trumpet because the Spirit of the Lord came. And then in public before this huge crowd of Israel is where he says to God, if you've called me to deliver Israel by your hand, then, then that's when he puts forth the fleece. And then you're going to see the same thing happen the following day when he says, O oh Lord God, you know, be not wroth with me. You know, let me ask you this one more time. And so he's going to put forth a second sign as far as the fleece is concerned. Now question, why in the world would he do that if he's doubtful? To convince others? Well, he's not doubtful. He's already been convinced as far as the fact that, you know, God's called him because the angel of the Lord presented himself before him in private. So he had knowledge and courage. He's basically stopping the mouths of those that would want to challenge him and say, hey, look, who are you? You know, aren't you the guy that threw down the, the altar to Baal and then destroyed our grove and all that? You know, so he's, he's basically, he's, he's being preempted to be able to go ahead and stop their mouth to say, hey, look, you guys, I'm called of God. And you got no argument against the fact that I'm called of God. I mean, I guess they could have said, they could have wanted to try to argue before, but he went ahead and preemptively said, you know, okay, put forth the fleece twice now with the miracle demonstrating as far as how God said, okay, hey, look, I'm going to do this. And so that's, that's preemptive on his part, basically, to stop him out to prove to them. He's already been convinced, so he doesn't really have an issue as far as being convinced. Okay, anyway, so um, next week we're going to be looking at a little bit like, no questions, and we're dismissed. Did we miss the New York story? Yeah, we missed it. That's his question. Oh, man. No.